Hello again. In the last program, we looked at some presenter and interview shots, and hopefully we learned some basic ideas about framing, composition, and lens angles. Now, all of those shots were static. Neither the camera nor the subjects moved at all. In the circumstances, it wasn't appropriate. However, television is a dynamic medium. We tell a story by moving through a succession of visual images. In interviews, we learned that the way to do this was by cutting from one camera to another, and it seemed quite natural. However, in other circumstances, the director may prefer to stay on one camera and allow the shot to develop. That is, change from one composition to another, either by moving the artist or the camera or both. For example, this deep two shot has developed from the original single of me that we saw just a few seconds ago. So, in this program, we'll be learning how to contain movement and how to develop a shot. And in particular, we'll be looking at movement within the static frame, the different effects of tracking and zooming, the use of pivot points and the importance of tracking lines. But first, movement within the frame. And the first rule is to avoid distracting camera movement wherever possible. For example, here the director has asked us to contain a two-shot as Karen moves forward to Mike. The opening of the shot seems okay, but as she comes forward, we're left with a poor composition, so we must move to compensate. But the movement around the foreground is distracting. Let's try again from another position. If we're careful, we can find a position that allows Karen to come forward while staying in the same place in frame. Notice that Karen is on a dividing third, and that she stays there during the move. Watch again. So wherever possible, Try to find a good composition that will contain the action within the frame without moving or panning the camera. Here we've asked Karen just to move from one side of the set to the other. We can contain this move without panning in this wide angle. But if we want to go closer, then we must pan with her. Let's see how not to do it. The pan should be perfectly synchronized with her move. We should have anticipated the start of her move, panned with her exactly as she moved, and of course, stopped panning when she came to rest. Let's try again. And that's better already. Another point to note is that we allow some space to the side of the frame to, as it were, allow her to move into. It's rather like the looking room we met in the previous program. Note how we have to gain this room quickly at the start of the pan and lose it smoothly at the end. Notice now what happens when Karen turns and moves directly back without stopping. The correct technique is to slow down the pan towards the end of the move so that the new moving room is established by the time she turns. It's important not to be caught panning while the subject is stationary. So far, our pan has only contained a move. It has not actually developed the shot. Generally, we pan from one composition to another different one. So let's look at a typical example. Mike is going to move to the map, and we're going to pan with him. Right, now the problem here is that the end of the shot is too tight. We can't see the map properly. We need to zoom out, tilt down, and set Mike further left. Before we have another go, let's take very careful note of some key points that will enable us to anticipate and repeat this framing. For instance, the shot just includes all of the map and cuts off about Mike's waist. Right, while Mike moves back to his original position, Remember that our pan, tilt, and zoom 
must all be synchronized, finishing together as Mike reaches his position at the map. One final point to note about the pan, it's better if the subject has to turn into frame rather than out of it. In this composition, Mike is left of frame. Now, if we pan him back to his first position, he must move out of frame left. Now, it can be done, but you must gain moving room very quickly at the start. So, to summarize the points on panning with action. Synchronize your pan with the artist's move. Accelerate and decelerate smoothly to gain and lose moving room. Anticipate the room required for a change of direction. And note that panning on a narrow angle looks faster. Anticipate any tilting, zooming and extra panning that may be needed to reach your final framing, making sure you come to rest with the subject. And during rehearsal, memorize key points about the final framing. So far we haven't moved the camera at all. We covered that last move on the zoom. However, in practice we may not be able to find a single compromised position for the start and finish of the shot, and anyway, moving the camera with the subject can give a more interesting effect. Let's see. Let's watch the camera this time. Now let's see the shot again. Let's examine the different effects of tracking and zooming more closely. We'll assume that we're going to tighten from this two-shot to a single of Karen. The motivation for this would be a line of dialogue or a slight turn by Mike. Now clearly we can cover this on the zoom. All parts of the picture get bigger equally and the effect is of the subject moving towards us. Let's now compare the effect of tracking in. Because the foreground gets bigger more quickly than the background, we feel we are moving into the subject. And out again. Now zooming again. And finally, tracking again. A more natural effect. In practice, developments are frequently a combination of tracking and zooming. Camera 3 was using a wide-angle lens for this track, about 40 degrees. But supposing we want to go into a full close-up, We'll get perspective distortion, and the set may well be in the way. Clearly, we must zoom in at some stage of the development. Well, the rule is simple. When tightening a shot, track first and zoom later. Think of the changeover as a mix, not a cut. It must be smooth and undetectable. A satisfactory close-up. And the camera is now about four feet away on an angle of about 24 degrees. Obviously, if we now perform this move in reverse, pulling out from Karen, we can't track out on such a narrow angle. So we must zoom first and then start to track back. 
Now, at what point should the changeover occur? It's difficult to be precise, but in general, once the foreground has been lost, the impact of the track is over and we can continue on the zoom. Let's see that. And zooming now, just as we go past Mike. So, to summarize, tracking in changes perspective and carries us naturally into the center of interest. Zooming produces a less natural effect because perspective remains unchanged and the subject appears to come towards us. In the first program in this series, we learned the basic mechanical technique of pivoting. Now we'll assume that this wide angle forms the opening of a program and that we're to tighten on the presenter. Now where is the pivot point? Let's say it's here. We'll try zooming in slowly and see how it goes. Now, this seems to be working. But if we then wish to go tighter than this, we need to change our pivot point to the top of frame. Let's watch it again. We'll do that as a track now, and of course the same rules of pivoting apply. In theory, if we find the ideal tracking line, we shouldn't need to pan the camera at all. Just as an experiment, we'll lock off. You should never do this in practice, of course. So now we're tracking in without panning, and we seem to be going a little too far right. Mike's beginning to slip out of frame left. So let's correct our line. OK, so now we've found the final position for the end of the shot. Let's pull out and see if we can get the right line. Of course, in practice, you can pan, but it's a worthwhile and interesting pictorial exercise to recognize these tracking lines. The closer you can get to an ideal line, the more natural and effective will your development appear. There's also a vertical component to such a line. At its simplest, we can examine this with a straightforward single. Now, suppose we want to tighten from this long shot to a medium close-up. The pivot point is the top of frame. Obviously, we could zoom and tilt. Or we could start lower and pivot by elevating the camera as we go in, moving the camera along a rising line. The effect can be very powerful. So let's now move back to the magazine program set and combine everything we've learned about pivots, tracking lines, and zooming. Tracking in on a wide-angle lens holding a perfect pivot, hardly panning or tilting at all. Losing the foreground now. Slowing the track, starting to zoom, and entirely on the zoom now. Well, if you've followed all three of these programs so far, you should have a fair idea how to set up and control a camera and its mounting, how to frame and compose simple static shots, and now how to cope with movement and development. Next stage is to build upon these fundamental principles by relating them in greater detail to specific programs. But in the meantime, keep up the practice.